Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church on this finally sunny, wonderful Sunday morning. We're so glad you're worshiping with us, whether you are here in our celebration center or joining us through our live stream, or whether you find this video some other time during the week or the month, or who knows? I mean, sometimes Facebook shows me the oddest things. You too? Okay, just me, great. Um, we are delighted that you have set apart this time to be in worship. A couple of uh, words of introduction. Uh, you'll notice that on the front of your worship guide, if you're here in the building, there's a QR code. If you're on the live stream, you'll notice that there will be a link that pops up in the comments. That is where you can check in and let us know you are worshiping with us today. It's also where you can update in for any information. If you have a new address or email address you'd like us to use, you can also share your joys and concerns there. That way we can continue to be a church that prays with and for one another. Well, anytime we come into worship, we want to make sure that everyone is greeted warmly, that no one walks out a stranger. And so in just a moment, I'll invite you to rise as you're able and greet those around you, preferably someone you don't live with or someone you didn't ride into church today with, um, and answer this question. What is one of your favorite things to see? What is a, one of the, your favorite sights? Okay, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I'm probably going to tell folks that one of my favorite things to see is a beautiful sunset because I do not get up usually for sunrises. And so I love to see a sunset. So let us rise as we're able and greet one another. Good morning. Please remain standing. Thank you. And we will do the call to worship responsively. We seek the word of God, but may not hear the messenger. Open our eyes and ears to receive your message. Help us to know the truth. With open hearts, may we know the word of God at work in the world and join us. Please remain standing and join me as we sing our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision. It's number 451 and the words will be on the screen.
Whenever we gather as a family of faith, it is our great privilege and responsibility to pray for each other and to pray for our world. And so let us go to God in prayer. Holy and merciful God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember with thanksgiving and sorrow the service members who have died in the violence of war. Each one is remembered by and known to you. We pray for all who love them in death as in life. We pray for all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day. We lift our voices with their family, friends, and all who pray for their safe return. We pray for the wounded and the disturbed, the grieving and the homeless, and for all who suffer due to war and conflict. We pray for civilian women, children, and men whose lives are disfigured by violence and terror. We pray for peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and safe. We pray for all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military, or religious. And we ask for gifts of wisdom and resolve in the search for reconciliation and peace. God of truth and justice, we hold before you those whose memory we cherish and those whose names we may never know. Help us to lift our eyes above the torment of this broken world and grant us the grace to pray for those who wish to do us harm. O oh God, hear our prayers for all who strive for peace and all who yearn for justice. As we honor the past and remember the cost of war, may we put our faith in your future that swords may be turned into plowshares, and that no one will need to learn war anymore. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite our youngest disciples to make their way up here as we welcome them in song. lovely to see all of you up here today. Uh, so today in our Bible story, we are going to talk about a guy who was named Saul. And does he have a soul? Yes, absolutely he does. We all get souls. We are all issued souls. So, um, but part of his story is that at a certain part in his journey, he can't see. All of a sudden, he's walking along with his traveling companions, and he can't see. And then he, they help him get to where he's going, but then he can't see for three days. Can you imagine? Okay, so I wanted to try a little something with us this morning. So as you are willing, if you would cover your eyes, grown-ups, you can do this too if you want. This is accessible for all ages. Yeah, you just cu close or cover your eyes, okay? And then I want you to tell me, what do you hear? You. Okay, but I stopped talking. What else do you hear? <laughs> the air conditioning, yes, thank God. People? People laughing. People laughing. I hear Okay, hold on. I, I hear Oscar yeah, and Ethan, yes. What do you hear, Oscar? You hear people putting on shoes? Wow, that's a very specific thing to hear. Oh, it's you. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, 
So, okay, so you, you tried hearing, okay, since we can't see, let's see, uh, let's try another one. Um, does anybody smell anything? Coffee. Coffee. I smell Coffee. Play-Doh. I smell the Air. Air. The I lovely, smell you smell allergies? <laughs> yes. You smell colors? Well, that's an interesting thing. Flowers. Okay. Hold on. Almost. Almost. Okay. Now, one last thing we're gonna try. What do you feel? You feel carpet. You feel your shoes. <laughs> you feel the pastor slash your mom's hand. Your clothes. Yeah. Okay. Well, open your eyes. You can uncover and open your eyes. You feel your brother Porter. Yes. I think the feeling is mutual, as a matter of fact. Um, so here's the thing we know. Sometimes when we don't have access to one of our senses, like we can't see, we, our other senses become sharper. We um, start to notice some things that we might not notice. Um, I don't know about you, but I often don't think about what I'm smelling unless it's really good or really bad. But if I close my eyes and I think about all the things I can feel and smell and hear, I notice that there's a whole lot going on around me than, more than what I may have noticed just by looking at it. And so I think for our um, friend Saul, who cannot see for three days in our story, um, not being able to see gives him a lot of time to think about some things that he may not have thought about before and to come to understand the world in a very different way. So um, I invite all of us this week to think about how we might engage the world in a different way than we're used to. Um, maybe it's taking time to give things a sniff. Maybe it's closing our eyes for a moment and listening to the world around us. Maybe um, it's feeling things, you know? I, I don't often feel the carpet because I'm always wearing shoes, but that's good, that's a good carpet. So think about where you might encounter the world in a new way this week and what those things might have to teach you. So let's pray if you'll repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank you for loving us. Thank you for, loving us. Thank you for our senses. That help us know the world around us. Help us to pay attention to what you are doing in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, y'all. Head back and have a great week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, whenever we come into worship, we have the opportunity to honor and praise God in a lot of different ways. We pray and we sing and we read scripture and we enjoy our time together for children's time, but we also um, receive an offering, a portion out of what God has so generously blessed us with that we put back into God's hands to do the work of ministry here and beyond. So I invite the ushers to come forward at this time that we might pray for this offering today. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we know that we enjoy so much abundance at your hands. There is beauty all around us, and there are more gifts than we often um, recognize. And so God, be with us in this time of offering. Inspire us to be about your work in the world. In Christ's name, amen.
invite you to pray with me and for me. Holy God, you know what it is that we need. You know what it is that we are searching for as we come into this time of worship. Surround each of us. Let us hear a word from you, through or in spite of all that's said or done in Christ's name. Amen. So y'all, after a really amazing Senior Sunday last week, we are picking up our series focusing on some of the heroes of our faith, people whose courage and strength and resilience can become models for our own lives. And this week, we're going to meet a hero named Saul, who will later become more well-known by the name Paul. So we meet, Paul, we meet Saul at the very end of Acts chapter 7, following the trial of Stephen. Stephen was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit who was commissioned by the apostles to wait on tables. That is, to keep the books and make sure that all of the poor and the widows of the new church community had enough. Because some folks were not getting enough. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So, of course, he was arrested and brought before the council. And the religious leaders became so furious. Our text reads that they were enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen, covering their ears so they could, didn't have to listen to one more word of his witness. So picking up in chapter 7, verse 57, we read, With a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. And to end the reading there. It goes on for verse 1 a little bit longer. But this is our first meeting of Saul, and what we hear is that he approved of their killing him. We don't know anything else about him at this point, this man who will become the apostle to the Gentiles, but could we imagine a more unlikely hero from this introduction? The rest of chapter 8 details the severe persecution that began against the church in Jerusalem from that day forward. All of the followers of Jesus, except the apostles, scattered across the countryside. We read that Saul ravaged the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. So who is this guy? Why is he so angry, so vindictive, so quick to become brutal and cruel? Well, if we look at his letter to the Philippians, we find some of Saul's credentials from chapter 3. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. When I hear that there's a man named Saul of the tribe of Benjamin, it reminds me of another man of the same name and tribe. If we turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 9, we read, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. He had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man, 
There was not a man among the Israelites more handsome than he. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Some interesting credentials. But in any case, we keep reading, Kish's donkeys wander off, so his handsome son, Saul, and his friends set off to find them. They look all over, but they can't find them. Finally, they end up in the land of Zoph, where the prophet Samuel lives. So the two young men decide to ask the man of God if he can tell them their way. Now, I think that they are assuming their way to the donkeys so that they can bring them back to, to Saul's dad. But little do they know, if we pick up our reading in verse 15. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time, I'll send to you a young man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be ruler over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen the suffering of my people because their outcry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man to whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall rule over my people. Then Saul approached Samuel inside the gate and said, Tell me, please, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the shrine, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I'll let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, give no further thought to them, for they've been found. And on whom is all is Israel's desire fixed, if not on you and on all your ancestral house? Saul answered, uh, I'm only a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel, and my family is the humblest of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him. He said, the Lord has anointed you ruler over his people Israel. You shall reign over the people of the Lord and you will save them from the hand of their enemies all around. This is the king who will send a young boy armed with nothing but a sling and a smooth stone to face a giant of a Philistine. This Saul if we have read much of our story from 1 Samuel, he's the one that will go astray, filled with anger and fear and jealousy as David ascends. Saul will lose God's favor and eventually fall in battle against these same Philistines. So I wonder what the first hearers of our story in Acts thought when they met another man named Saul of the tribe of Benjamin, a man who had a perfect resume and was convinced that he was right. He knew he had God and faith all figured out. He was so absolutely certain that he was right that he could stand by and keep an eye on the cloaks and coats while an angry mob stoned a man to death. This Saul knew that he was right such that he himself was moved to violence, terrorizing Jerusalem as he went house to house, dragging out followers of Jesus wherever he found them, no matter if they left sobbing children behind, no matter if they left elderly parents at their home. I wonder if this made perfect sense to those first hearers because this is exactly what a man named Saul would do. He would know that he was right and he would lose the way of righteousness in the process. So let's continue with the story of Saul we find in Acts as we pick up our reading for today from the Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 beginning at verse 1. Let us listen together for a word from God. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, 
who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately... Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the same man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. So I invite you to imagine yourself in Ananias' sandals for just a minute. It's an ordinary day in Damascus. You're going about your work you know that there's a gathering of the followers of Jesus this week, and you want to go, so you're thinking about how you can get there secretly, stealthily. You don't want too many people to know what you're doing or where you're going because you've heard about what's happening down in Jerusalem. Just a few days ago, another believer came to the doorway, breathless, sharing the news that Saul, that terrible zealot, had asked for and received permission to come here, to do the same things here in your hometown, ripping apart your community, putting men and women in prison, hoping that the authorities might find them guilty and maybe even put them to death. Ugh. I mean, maybe it's time to move. But where would you go? But then you have a vision, and you hear the presence of God, and, and God calls you by name. You know the right answer. You've read your scriptural stories, and when God calls you by name, you know the answer is, here I am, Lord. Maybe God will give you some insight on how to avoid the coming persecution. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll be commissioned to lead God's faithful followers out of Damascus and to some place that will be safe. Wow, this is going to be amazing. Can't wait to hear what God has to say. But then you hear what God actually has to say. Go get Saul. You know that guy you heard about? Go get Saul. You're going to lay your hands on him and he'll be able to see again. What? No! You know this guy. You know what he's done. So you ask, hmm, God, are you sure? Uh, this guy, I'm pretty sure, is bad news. You, I mean, I know you know what he's done to your followers in Jerusalem. And now he is coming here to do the same thing. But God 
insists. Go, I'm going to use this man to share good news with Gentiles and Jews, and don't worry, don't worry, Ananias. He's going to suffer because this road will be hard, but I need you to go to him. So Ananias does. Even knowing that he might be risking his own life, Ananias does what God asks him to do. He doesn't know anything about Saul's epiphany, how he was confronted by the risen Christ on the road, the flash of light, the voice from heaven, how he sat in darkness for three days, confronted by the ugly truth that when he knew he was absolutely right, that he, Saul, was working on God's behalf, he was actually absolutely wrong. He had caused pain and suffering and death. Grief-stricken Saul has sat in Damascus, not eating, not drinking, alone with his thoughts and wondering what Jesus will do to him next. What would he be told to do? Ananias finds Saul at the house of Judas on Straight Street, just like God said, and offers not only healing, but power, a way of being righteous without needing to always be right, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit. I mean, after all, I feel like Ananias probably thought that he was right, that Saul was bad news, that he was an enemy of the church, but unlike Saul, Ananias was willing to let go of being right so that he could be truly righteous, to offer grace and mercy even to one like Saul, who definitely didn't deserve it. And now, only now, does Saul get to become what he thought he already was, an instrument of God, receiving his sight, baptized, and full of the Holy Spirit for the work ahead? Y'all, I don't think it was any coincidence that Saul was blind for three days, the same number of days that Jesus spent in the tomb. New life isn't always as dramatic as a guy folding up his grave clothes and walking out of a tomb. Sometimes it's an intervention and the following reflection on the direction of our lives. Sometimes, as our youth brought up last week, it's gradual growth over time that leads us to grow and change and become more of who God has created us to be. I wonder if there have been times when we've been so busy trying to be right that we lose the path of righteousness. Are there times that our zeal, like Saul's, was misdirected and destructive? Do we fully expect God to ask us to do difficult things and go to unexpected places? Or do we say, no thanks, I'm comfy right here, Lord. Don't ask me to move. And are there times that we exclude those whom we consider our enemies from the work that God might do in the world? Because we're convinced we know we're right, that they are beyond God's grace. Mm. Saul goes on, as we know, to introduce himself as Paul in all of his letters as he writes to the many churches he starts and encourages all around Asia Minor and Greece and Macedonia. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, 13 or 14 are traditionally attributed by, to Paul although only seven are accepted as being entirely authentic, no AI, clearly written by Paul. Thank you. But if we only accept the letters that we know are authentic, clearly from Paul, that still accounts for roughly 25% of the New Testament. And yet, Paul describes himself as the least of the apostles a servant of Jesus Christ. He will suffer for his faith. There will be shipwrecks. There will be trials. There will be imprisonment. And ultimately, 
the death of a martyr. But Paul would say it was worth it. In his own words from Philippians chapter 3, we read, Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. Paul had to let go of being right to become righteous. Beloved, we know that in a divided world, hatred can bubble up in, even in the hearts of those who seek to do good. But thanks be to God that the risen Christ moves us from judgment to connection so that we can work together for the sake of God's reign. This same man, born Saul, known to us as Paul, put his whole self in as a follower of Jesus. He brought all the best of who he had been, the same passion, the same way of skillfully building an argument, the same knowledge of history, the same willingness to work and to make those tents and to write those letters. But his aim became truly aligned with God's purpose. He became one who was willing to declare that there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So, beloved, I suggest to you that Paul's a hero because he was willing to change. His death dealing was confounded by new life. His oppression was swallowed up by freedom. His hatred was answered by love, and the enemy became God's beloved. He was able to see truly what had always been the case. If it could happen for Saul, who knows what God might be able to do with us. Glory be to God. Amen. Stand and join me in the affirmation of our faith. We believe in God, holy source of all that is. We believe in God, who has spoken the eternal word in Jesus Christ. We believe in God, ceaselessly breathing spirit into creation. We trust in God's love and wisdom, fully real. Jesus Christ, present to us through the spirits working in the church and beyond. We believe that God is calling the whole creation into a future of justice and peace. We share in Christ's risen life and commit ourselves today to receive the coming reign of God. To our God, three yet one, be all honor and glory and praise now and forever. Amen. A couple of invitations before we head out on our way today. Uh, anybody got plans for Saturday, this next Saturday? The answer is, yeah, you do, because there's a summer lawn party happening, weather permitting. My goodness, weather permitting. And the assignments are right here. Um, we expect our guests to bring nothing, but if uh, your last name begins with an A through E, we're asking you to bring hot dog toppings or chips, last names F through M, side dishes, last names N through Z, desserts. L bring a camp chair. Uh, there'll be yard games. There's going to be wonderful music. It's going to be a lot of fun. So goodness gracious, let's hope the weather permits and we are able to have our summer lawn party next Saturday. Also coming up soon is uh, our turn to host Family Promise. 
Uh, Family Promise is a wonderful organization that uh, provides places to stay through the generosity of church families for families with minor children experiencing homelessness. So we're hosting June 9th through 23rd. If you are curious about that, you don't know what that might look like, but you are moved to help. Um, Where's Peach? I saw her earlier. All right, well, Lee's in the back. Lee, would you? Lee will tell you more about it if you have questions about that. Also, Vacation Bible School is coming up. We are partnering with First United Methodist Church here in Sherman to offer Vacation Bible School. There is a QR code there. There's a link on the Facebook. If you are interested in a child you know being registered to go or you would like to volunteer, let me know. I'll be happy to supply all that information to you. All right, beloved, consider those invitations as we sing our closing hymn. Join me in singing Amazing Grace, number 378. Beloved, receive this blessing. Go forth, surrounded by the Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ, to maybe not always get it right, but to truly walk in the path of God's righteousness. Go, for you are sent in Christ's name. And the church said,